Yeah, he's very well represented, and he's actually really cutting edge on the Bitcoin. I'm really excited for this. So anyways, guys, give it up for Chris Dunn. Thanks, Zach. What's up, guys? How's it going? All right, so how many of you guys have heard about Bitcoin? Raise your hands. How many of you guys have heard about Bitcoin and you kind of think it's like a Ponzi scheme or a pump and dump or something like that? All right, cool. I did too. So I first heard about Bitcoin in uh, 2013 and um, basically uh, started trading it. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into this. So risk disclaimer, uh, content is for education purposes only. Uh, trading is risky. A lot of people lose money and don't trade with money you can't afford to lose. So let's talk about what you're going to learn today. What is Bitcoin? Okay, there's a lot of myths around it. Whenever I first heard about it, I thought it was a penny stock because the first time I saw it, the chart uh, basically had like a parabolic pattern, you know, parabolic uh, pump and crash. And um, so I thought it was a uh, pump and dump, um, but I soon realized that it was much more than that. So um, I'm also going to talk about why Wall Street is heavily investing in Bitcoin. You know, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, a lot of VCs and angels are now investing in Bitcoin. Um, and I'm also going to talk about why I think Bitcoin can be one of the easiest markets to trade for now. There's kind of a unique situation um, in the Bitcoin market that makes it pretty easy to trade compared to a lot of the other markets that I've traded, like futures and stocks and stuff like that. Um, I'm also going to talk about the three principles uh, to find the best trade setups. All right, so who am I? I'm a reformed day trader. What does that mean? Well, I used to think that I had to sit there and trade all day, every day, and it was really, really stressful. And I made some money, I lost some money. And what I learned was I do really, really well under certain market conditions and I suck in others. So to myself, I said, okay, Chris, you're no longer a day trader, you're an opportunist. Whenever the markets are ripe for trading, think like a hunter. You know, if you're hunting for, say, deer, and I don't know, I don't really hunt, but if you're in the woods and you're looking for a 12-point buck, you're not going to shoot at every damn squirrel that walks by, right? You're, you're going to burn up your capital. You're going to scare stuff away. So what I said is, okay, well, I'm going to save my ammo for the absolute best market conditions and the absolute best setups. And so what I've done is I've spent the last few years really investing investing in my trading team. So my beautiful wife, Nikki. Nikki, where are you at? Stand up. Let's give Nikki a hand. <laughs> She's hating me right now. She is so angry. <laughs> um, so I've also got Justin Lyon who trades uh, e-minis and he runs our e-mini room. Um, but that's what I've been spending my time doing is really focusing on trading the best market conditions and then letting other people that are better at me with certain markets and certain strategies um, kind of pick up that slack and trade all day, every day. I'm also a real estate investor. I do a lot of um, fix and flips and multifamily stuff in Central Texas. I'm uh, an angel investor in Austin, Texas, so I work with tech startups. And I'm really, really interested uh, working with Bitcoin startups. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. Now, whenever I started trading Bitcoin in 2013, it was more of an experiment, because like I said, I thought it was like a Ponzi scheme or a pump and dump. It looked exactly like a penny stock chart. Um, and I started posting my trades and my market forecasts on tradingview.com, and I became like a top 10 contributor or whatever, because my trades and my predictions and my analysis of Bitcoin was just very, very accurate. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, I want to play this. I don't know if we can play this video, but... Um, I just want, for anybody that doesn't really understand Bitcoin, I want to talk about the basics of it and um, kind of what it is, how it works, and then we'll jump into the trading stuff. So I don't know if I can play this video. Let's see. Doesn't look like it. All right. I'll just explain it. So Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency. Have you guys heard of BitTorrents? Anybody know what BitTorrents are? Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system, and basically it's a decentralized currency, which means no single government has control over it. It's a 
currency of the people. A lot of people call it like magic internet money, but what it really is is a peer-to-peer -peer currency and it spins like digital cash or gold. It's kind of like sending cash through email. That's kind of the best way that I can explain it. And the biggest benefit to Bitcoin is you transfer unlimited amount of money almost instantly for basically free with no government red tape, which I think is really huge. And it's gonna change the way that people do international remittances, um, buy and sell real estate. I'm talking to a couple startups that are looking to really just change the way that we do real estate transactions. So it's pretty cool. Now what is what Bitcoin is not? Now despite the popular kind of gold coin, Bitcoin isn't a gold coin. It's, there's nothing physical. Now you can print gold coins and then have your Bitcoin addresses on them, but it's not backed by gold or anything like that. It's also not a stock. A lot of people ask me, well Chris, what's the ticker so I can look it up in my trading platform? It doesn't trade on a stock exchange. It actually has its own exchanges. So I don't know how clearly you guys can see this, but this is a list of the top Bitcoin exchanges um, and they're sorted by market share. So as of a couple days ago, Bitstamp, ItBit, see if that works, there we go. ItBit, Bitfinex, OKCoin, BTCE, Coinbase. These are all exchanges that you trade through. And there's no broker, that's a huge benefit, is you can actually trade directly through the exchange. Um, let me see, what else about exchanges? So, why is Bitcoin important today? Well, moving money and settling transactions comes with a lot of friction and it's expensive. You know, in the stock world we have T plus three, takes time to clear transactions. Um, if you're sending and receiving money, you have wire fees and it can take up to a day to, you know, clear cash. Um, and there's currency spreads. So if you're sending or receiving money between different currencies, you lose some of that value on the spread, right? Um, and so just to give you an example of how powerful this is, there was a transaction of about 150 million bucks worth of Bitcoin. Nobody knows who sent it to who, but it was transferred in a few minutes for just a few pennies with no government red tape, which I think is just huge. Also, Bitcoin is really important today because there are still billions of people without access to important banking services. You know, credit cards, checking accounts, you'd be surprised how many people don't have access to these things. And there's a lot of people around the world that are suffering from inflation and currency controls. So, you know, I'm sure everybody here has heard about the stuff that's going on in Greece and Cyprus with the bail-ins, Argentina, and then the most extreme example of Zimbabwe where they went through hyperinflation and they really have no stable currency. There's a lot of big people that are backing Bitcoin today. So Richard Branson said, I've invested in Bitcoin because I believe in its potential and the capacity it has to transform global payments is very exciting. Um, Bill Gates, Bitcoin's a technological tour de force. Eric Schmidt, Bitcoin is a remarkable achievement. And the list goes on and on. P you know, Peter Thiel, um, I think Bitcoin is the first digital currency that has the potential to do something like, I don't know, change the world. A lot of companies accept Bitcoin and this list grows every day. So Microsoft, Dell, Expedia, Amazon, PayPal, eBay, Shopify. It opens you up to a whole nother ecosystem of hungry buyers. So if you own a business, this is a great thing to start accepting. I want to talk a little bit about kind of the history of Bitcoin, where it's been and where it is today and where I think it's going in the future. And then I'll show you how to trade it. So Bitcoin was actually started by an anonymous person in 2009, kind of a community of hackers and geeks. And in 2009 to 2010, there was really no value associated with Bitcoin. Um, it was just a couple of guys on a forum and message board just kind of talking about it with these libertarian views of, you know, having control over your currency and being able to send money. And then in 2011 to 2013, this is when a lot of people first heard about Bitcoin. 
This was the early adopter phase. And we saw some early interest from investors and entrepreneurs. And then last year in 2014, the VC phase, we had a lot of uh, money starting to pour into the ecosystem. And then 2015 has actually been a really huge year for Bitcoin, despite the price crashing. So we'll look at charts and I'll talk about what the value of Bitcoin's done. But the most important thing, and I was actually telling people this in 2013, you know, the institutional um, companies and professionals on Wall Street were kind of laughing Bitcoin off as like, you know, just a little fad or something, but you'll see how that's changed today. Last week, uh, the NASDAQ, uh, along with Visa, just invested 30 million bucks into a Bitcoin startup. And this shows the blue kind of area shows the uh, total funding of Bitcoin startups. So you can see this is like 2013 where the money really started to come in. And as of today, I believe we're just shy of a billion dollars invested in Bitcoin companies. And there's even an angel group called BitAngels that their sole focus is to raise capital and help entrepreneurs create companies um, for the Bitcoin ecosystem. All right, so let's talk about some of the myths and misconceptions around Bitcoin. The first one, and probably the biggest one, and this is what I thought, Bitcoin's a bubble. Well, Bitcoin's had many bubbles, and this is actually what makes Bitcoin so attractive as a trading vehicle. This is the first bubble in 2011, where it basically ramped up from 50 cents $32 and then crashed back to $2. This is the first time I heard about it and I looked at that and I said, wow, that looks like a Tim Sykes pattern. <laughs> looks like a pump and dump, right guys? Parabolic and then I thought this was the long kiss good night. I thought, I'm like, all right, not interested. This thing's dead. And then this happened, 2013. I actually had a friend that called me on the day before the, the red bar or the red candle and he goes, Chris, you know, what do you think about Bitcoin? And I had kind of forgotten about it. And I looked at it and it was over $200. And I'm like, no, man, I wouldn't buy here. This thing's going parabolic. Like you, you have to wait for a pullback. And then the very next day it started the crash. And, but the interesting thing here is look where it started. So this is the second bubble, right? $35. So it recovered from its first bubble. The first bubble was, you know, 50 cents went up to 30 something and then crashed, and then it ramped back up. It had a healthy trend to, two, to 35, and then it went parabolic over uh, 260. So I go, okay, there's something to this. It didn't, it's not just like a one and done pump and dump. There might actually be something here. So this is when I started really taking Bitcoin seriously and started um, researching how to trade it. Then later in 2013, this is what I call the China bubble. Bitcoin ramped back up to $100, and then it went absolutely insane. Went over 1,000 bucks per coin. And this is where I started doing um, YouTube videos and just some education around Bitcoin because I saw a lot of people chasing. You know, a lot of people got starry-eyed and looked at this when Bitcoin was around 1,000. And hindsight's always 20-20, right? It's easy to look back and go, oh yeah, I would have never bought up there. Maybe some of you guys did. But I was just trying to educate people and warn them, like, look, guys, is Bitcoin a good investment? I did a video talking about that, and I said, if you're comfortable buying something that's up, you know, 10, 100x or more, go ahead, but be aware of the risks. So what happened is um, I was trading it long on the way up. You can see several breakout patterns, and we'll dive into some trades here in a second. Um, but once it had that first pullback, I was like, how the hell do you short this? There was really no way to short it, and I was telling people, like, guys, I love Bitcoin, I think it's the future, but I'm not a blind speculator, I'm not a cheerleader, I'm not a pumper for this. I'm a trader, I wanna trade in and out of it. Um, so I started looking at some exchanges and looked for shorting opportunities. So I'll show you some of those charts here in a second. But to kind of talk about the, the myth again, is Bitcoin a bubble, is it a fad, is it gonna go away? Nobody can predict the future, but this, is the most important thing um, that I think is a prediction of where Bitcoin's going. This is the daily Bitcoin transactions from 2009 to 2015. If 
you look from 2009 to basically the spring of 2012, there was hardly anybody using it. But if you look over the past several years, the daily transactions is now well over 100,000 transactions a day. Now, that's absolutely nothing compared to the amount of credit card transactions and cash transactions, but the trend is going in the right direction. A couple other myths. Uh, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. Why is Bitcoin today worth 240 bucks? You know, why do people trust it? Why does it have value? It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by a government. It has value because people trust it because it's an open source currency, meaning you can look at the code, you can audit the code and say, look, this is exactly how Bitcoin works, and there's a, a $3 billion stake for anybody that can hack it, and to this date, nobody's hacked it. Now, there have been horror stories like Mt. Gox. Has anybody heard of Mt. Gox or the Silk Road or anything like that? So Mt. Gox was an exchange that basically kind of fueled this. Right, and it's very interesting read. There's a, a good book called Digital Gold. I highly recommend it if you're like a geek like me and you just want to know the whole history of Bitcoin. Um, but a lot of people lost a lot of money with Mt. Gox, and I did another video warning people months in advance. I said, guys, this exchange sucks. I highly doubt that they're solvent. Get your money out. And thankfully, a lot of people listened to me. Unfortunately, some people didn't, and they lost a lot of money. And that put a really bad taste in a lot of people's mouth about Bitcoin. Um, but today we have safer exchanges like Coinbase and there's U.S. exchanges that are, you know, insured and backed by uh, really big investors. But even to this day, I don't trust exchanges. The way that I trade is I keep a lot of my value in cold storage. So basically just like keeping cash in your wallet. And then whenever I see a trade, or whenever I think a big trade is coming up, I'll move money into an exchange, trade it, and then pull the value back out, okay? Um, so the, just to kind of touch on that again, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. It has value because people trust it. And a lot of people trust it more than the current fiat system that we have today. Um, another one is Bitcoin's only for hackers and drug dealers. You know, Silk Road was a huge thing. I mean, this is really what fueled Bitcoin and got it going, was people wanted an anonymous way to buy drugs. But today, that's not the case. I mean, as you saw, I mean, there's a huge list of companies that are using it. Um, there's a South American company, or South American country, that's working with an Austin startup, and they're putting their entire property deed system on the Bitcoin blockchain to help track uh, transfer of title and transfer of ownership of property because the government down there is so corrupt that basically government officials were going in and just stealing properties and just writing their name as owner. So that's how solid the Bitcoin blockchain is. It's a public ledger um, that can't be altered or changed. All right, let's talk about trading Bitcoin versus trading some other markets. So the beautiful thing here is there's no account or trade size minimums, so you can trade with five bucks if you want. You don't have to go through a broker, you go trade directly through the exchange, and anybody can open an account in a few minutes. Um, there's significantly less trading competition compared to traditional markets. So, like in the futures markets, it used to be a lot easier to trade in the early 2000s, but today, half of the trading volume is done by high frequency algorithms and professionals on Wall Street. With Bitcoin, it's kind of like penny stocks where you don't have big funds that you're competing against. Um, you're basically trading against highly emotional people that are just kind of speculating or they don't really understand chart patterns and even the basics. So that's why over the past couple of years, uh, my trades have been so accurate is because it's not because I'm some great trader, it's because the patterns just work. There's not a lot of games being played. Now, Wall Street is looking at Bitcoin and they're creating derivatives like futures and options for Bitcoin. They're creating high frequency stuff. So who knows how long this unique opportunity is gonna last, but the environment is really good right now. Um, it's easier to short than some stocks. You know, there's never an issue with getting borrows. There's no short selling restrictions, anything like that. 
uh, you trade directly through the exchange. And what I love about it is the volatility. Bigger volatility equals more opportunity. All right. Let's talk about three principles for finding the highest probability trades, and I'll show you kind of how I trade this. So I don't day trade Bitcoin. Like I said, I'm a reformed day trader. I don't trade every day. In fact, on average, I only take a couple trades a month in Bitcoin, but I look for big moves, anywhere from 15 to 60 percent. Now, the large majority of traders in Bitcoin are highly emotional and undisciplined. We call that dumb money. That's actually a technical term. You know, when, when have you ever heard somebody say like, oh yeah, I heard about Bitcoin, I'll throw 100 bucks at it and hopefully it goes to 10,000. That's what I'm talking about. People that just kind of throw money and they chase trends and they panic on crashes. That's what creates all this volatility and creates these unsustainable uptrends and massive panics. And I'll show you examples of this. So. This was actually my first trade of the year. This was the second week in January. And Bitcoin crashed from like the 300s down to 166, I think was the low. And if you notice through here, this is what I call a healthy downtrend. So run retracement, run retracement, run retracement, washout. So basically, you know, went parabolic to the downside, right? just washed out. Anybody that was a bag holder or anybody that was sitting there watching, going, man, I'm kind of nervous. Oh crap, it's crashing, sell, 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 sell. When this exhausts itself, the only place it can go is up. So what I did is I actually bought here uh, at 188, once it started to stabilize, because the thing with washouts, guys, is you never know where the bounce is gonna come from. And if you try to pick tops and bottoms, sometimes you can get run over. So the two things that I like to use to kind of minimize risk is scaling in with position sizing. So you, let's say you want to risk a thousand bucks. You don't go all in with a thousand bucks. You scale in. Maybe you get in 200, 200, 200, and you finesse the entry. And so that's kind of what I did through here. Once it started to stabilize, started buying on the dip adding in, adding in, and then had an average uh, entry of 188. Okay, so the second principle is in Bitcoin, the best liquidity, and this can actually be said for all markets, um, but specifically in Bitcoin, the, the best liquidity comes uh, when big moves are driven by emotion. So we stay away from trading during times of low volatility and low volume. So this is just an example of some chop. And I want to show you kind of like fake out breakout patterns. So whenever there's very low volume, whenever the market's kind of just chopping sideways, what you'll see is these fake out breakdown patterns. So you'll have support, it'll stab through, grab stops, suck in breakdown shorts, reverse, there's resistance, slices up, takes stops for shorts, sucks in breakout buyers, and then reverses. So this is actually, this pattern, you'll see that in um, stocks, futures, options, every market you'll get you know, fake out, breakout, and fake out, breakdown patterns. But when there's no liquidity, don't try to trade Bitcoin. There's just not enough there yet. The third principle is some of the best risk to reward setups come when we're able to anticipate breaks of key levels um, for one of like three reasons. Actually, all these things tend to happen at the same time. Let me, let me actually show you the chart and then we'll talk about those three things. So this was uh, the second trade of the year where we had a spike on volume. So I think there was some kind of good news through here. And then it went sideways and choppy and then started to consolidate for several weeks. And then through here, we actually had a news catalyst. There was some kind of VC firm or somebody got, uh, I think it was Coinbase got 75 million as an investment. And so we saw volume come in. And so this was a, an emotion driven pop, right? So what happens whenever you break through this level on volume, what happens is you, attr you attract breakout buyers, okay? So people see that, and buying begets more buying begets more buying. 
It triggers stops for anybody that was short, which those are buy orders. And then any potential shorts run away in the face of momentum. If you're thinking about shorting, they go, nope, not gonna do it. Okay, so what happens is you end up getting these really massive runs anywhere from you know, 10, 15%, as much as like 60, 65%. Um, so let's look at some trade setups and some trades. Okay, so this was, uh, this is going back to the end of 2013, okay? So this is the, the China bubble where it basically double topped up around 1,000. And this was the first time that Bitcoin really showed any weakness since early 2013. And whenever it panicked, kind of bottomed out here in the, uh, the mid sixes, I was buying through this level, looking for a retest of resistance through there, okay? So when everybody else is panicking, I'm looking to buy. And again, you gotta kind of finesse the entry with position sizing, but I like to do what the opposite of the herd does. And it's like one more, what Warren Buffett says, when people are greedy, be scared, when people are scared, be greedy. And that's what I did on this buy, is everybody was panicking, the message boards, everybody's like, oh my God, Bitcoin's done. All I knew was this was an emotional crash from everybody that bought at the high, okay? So everybody was speculating that Bitcoin was going to like 5,000 a coin, and you know, people that chase, they get slapped. And that's what happened here. So as soon as this started to roll over, so what happened is we tested prior resistance, we had a lower high, started to um, retest support, and then we put in a lower high, and this was the, the first uh, short that I was looking at. I was like talking to exchanges like, come on guys, we, we gotta have a way to short this, and this is around this time in early 2014 is the first time that I, I was actually able to start shorting. Um, this is a, another example of a short. So parabolic move, crash, a lot of times it's not easy to predict the top of a market, but once it puts in a lower high and then starts to fade, you can basically look for snaps of support. So that's what this setup was. Um, just like any market, you have to be really disciplined with your stops. Um, because if you're, say you're long, so this was actually a trade that I was anticipating a bounce. This is a, a really long-term chart from, you know, late 2013 into spring of 2014. And we were in a very, very clear downtrend. We had trend line of resistance, a lot of lower highs, but I was basically probing this as a bounce, looking for a snap of this trend line. And I was telling everybody like, look guys, we're obviously in a downtrend and it's okay to trade counter to trend, but you just need to have really, really tight stops. So what happened is as soon as we took out this pivot low, had the stops in place instead of like holding and hoping, because if you hope, you're gonna get run over. Um, this was a second bounce. So this was another kind of big crash around that Mount Gox fiasco. Um, Bought here right at 502. Once the, uh, this candle closed and started to reverse, um, we noticed that, you know, if you look from like a crash of, you know, mid 800s down into the, the 400s, that's gonna bounce. Once everybody panics, the bigger the panic, the bigger the bounce is gonna be. So um, bought there at 502 and basically held for a retest of prior resistance up around 830. So that was actually my biggest trade to date, which was about 65%. Um, and then this is covering uh, 2015. This was the panic that I was showing you guys earlier from you know, the 300s, healthy downtrend, healthy downtrend, washout, bought at 188, held for the spike, consolidation, consolidation, and then there's the breakout pattern with the, uh, the news catalyst. And basically, I got kind of lucky here on the exit. We were on a flight while this thing was going parabolic, and as soon as I landed, um, was able to, to scale out of that. So kind of the, the benefit to Bitcoin, pro and con, is it trades 24-7. Um, so it's really important to have alerts in place. So I have this uh, iPhone app called ZeroBlock, and what I do is I 
I basically frame price. So I say, if price breaks up above here or below here, that could potentially trigger a trade. So that's how I kind of stay engaged without having to watch the charts all the time, is I just let the market tell me when it's making a move and I ignore everything else. Okay, so just like we have silver to gold, we also have Litecoin to Bitcoin. So there's alternative currencies, or as we call them, altcoins, and some of them are better than others. Some of the, the more popular ones are you know, Litecoin, Ripple, Ethereum, BitShares. Um, these are all different types of digital currencies that are trying to compete with Bitcoin. And they all offer a unique um, benefit. All of them are trying to solve problems that Bitcoin maybe isn't that great at handling. Um, and just like penny stocks, you know, most altcoins are junk. Um, there are several hundred altcoins people are just creating all the time. Um, but you really only want to trade coins that have healthy volume and volatility. And so a website that I use is coinmarketcap.com. And what this site does is it basically shows you by market cap all of the different uh, digital currencies. And so you can see, this was like two days ago I took this picture, Bitcoin market cap is 3.4 billion. Um, the price is still hovering around 240. Um, you can see a, a price trend graph, the dollar volume. So during that 24 hour period, it had traded about $20 million. So there's healthy liquidity there. Like it's not as liquid as the S&P, but it's growing. Um, and then you can see as we go down, you know, we have like Ripple, Litecoin, Ethereum, BitShares. These are all just different alt currencies. So how do you trade it? Where do you go? How do you actually execute um, trades? So you, like I said, you trade directly through the exchanges. So typically what you'll do is you'll go to the exchange website. So you could go to you know, Bitfinex, Go back to the exchanges. Ah, forget it. So we'll go to um, go directly to the exchange. But you, there's this new uh, website that just came out. It's called Coinigy, and basically what you can do is trade through all the exchanges, all the altcoins in one place. So I just recently started trading through this and I really like it because it kind of keeps everything centralized. So you won't need like, you know, TradeStation or interactive brokers, any of those platforms. Um, you can just trade through this site and I think it's like 19 bucks a month or something. And what I'm gonna do next week for everybody, you guys are automatically registered for this. So I'll just send you guys um, the details, and if you want to come to this, I'm going to do a, a live market webinar next week where I'll show you some more of the intricacies of like how to actually place orders, um, how to work with the exchanges, which ones I'm using today, which ones you want to stay away from, and then you know how to buy your first coins, how to short, all that good stuff. And you know we'll have a deep dive into the current price action and some recent setups. So. Let's talk about the future of Bitcoin. Digital currencies have been around since the 1980s, but Bitcoin is the first really successful experiment. I call it an experiment because it's not proven. Nobody knows where this is gonna be in, in a few years. On one end, you know, you have people that are saying this is gonna be the dominant currency for the world. On the other end, you have people that are like, just write it off and say, I don't even wanna know about it. I'll make one prediction, which is this. Digital currencies are here to stay. They're not going anywhere, guys. But nobody knows what they're gonna look like six months from now, six years from now. Kind of think about AOL versus Facebook. So anybody remember getting those CDs where you had like 50 hours on AOL and that was the internet, basically? You guys remember that? Back then, nobody could have predicted that Facebook would have its insane valuation or that our lives would be lived through social media 
and online. Nobody knew how the internet was really gonna affect the world. He had some visionaries that had some ideas, but looking back to the AOL days, nobody could predict Facebook. And, and I think that's kind of the same way that digital currencies are right now, is it's cool, it works, people like it, it's growing, but nobody knows where it's truly gonna be in several years. So my best recommendation is just to educate yourself. You know, be aware of the latest trends. Understand digital currencies, because this isn't something that you're gonna wanna ignore and then 10 years later wish that you would've you know, traded it, invested in it, and just understood it. So I trade it on a swing basis, so a couple trades a month. I'm also looking to invest in Bitcoin startups, and I'm here to help you guys learn how to do the same. So I'm not sure how we're doing on time, Zach, but um, maybe we can take some questions, or if we wanna hold those for later, it's up to, uh, up to Zach. But uh, yeah, that's basically it, guys. Um, educate yourself, be aware, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we got one question. Yeah. Well, first off, Chris, I didn't hear anyone say thank you for offering that uh, live Bitcoin webinar. Is, is anyone going to join that? And it's free, and it's good. So wh where's the question, Ben? If trading Bitcoins, how often should you convert to U.S. currency any regulation on converting Bitcoin to U.S.? Not that I'm aware of. Um, basically, what I do is I'll keep a lot of my Bitcoins in cold storage, so basically offline, off of an exchange, and then whenever I want to make a trade, I'll make a deposit into the exchange, which sounds complicated, but it's actually really easy. Um, and yeah, that's it. Real simple, just move it on an exchange, move it off an exchange, because just like Mt. Gox was a horror story, I think that we've learned a lot since then, but stuff like that could still happen. So just treat Bitcoin for what it really is, which is digital cash. You know, it's, it's definitely something that, um, you know, if you, if you give it away, it's gone. There was actually a story of a guy that um, had a bunch of Bitcoin on his computer and forgot about it, threw his computer away, and he went to check and he lost $9 million worth of Bitcoin. He went to the dump and tried to find it for, for months and couldn't find it. So treat it like cash. And we're gonna save the other questions for the round table on Bitcoin. So, okay, cool. uh, is that cool? Yeah, yeah. So it'll be uh, more of like a teaching environment. So anyways, everyone, give it up for Chris Dunn. Thanks, guys.